I need to get my mood going. What's up, everybody, and welcome to the No BS Real Estate Show, a podcast that gives you an inside look on how to make smart financial decisions while adding value to your life. I'm Matty Miller with ERA Real Estate, alongside my co-host and real estate investor extraordinaire, Ryan Robbins. Whether you're a longtime investor or a first-time buyer, join us as we dig through the everyday bullshit of real estate. Mr. Ryan Robbins, how are you, sir? Matt Miller. We are Matt, Matt whatever you want to do. Matt you, me. you Miller. Some people some people have worse words for me. Some people call me an asshole. Some people call me, you know, their best friend. So there's both. So there's all that stuff. Um what's going on, man? Uh we kind of screwed up yesterday because we had some technical difficulties getting the podcast up and running. So we switched up some video stuff and we switched up some audio stuff in hopes of getting even a better product out, um, which we're going to find out. So this is kind of our first run here. <laughs> so as far as the product, we're just winging it quality, you know, Pretty much, material wise. Yeah, today. Is, we're going to wing it, but yeah. at least the audio sounds good. The audio sounds good. The video looks good. Um, we're, we're getting there. So we're eventually going to become professional podcasters um, at this point. And by professional, I mean, make no money, but really, really sound good and look as good as we can i mean that's kind of what we're going for so today we're talking it's about 2019. it's not about actually being successful it's just about looking successful it's about, it's about playing the part okay that's, that is matters that, is that what i've missed out on all these times I've, just, I've always you know i've always thought it was about actually getting shit done but i guess it's just about looking like you're getting stuff done you gotta look good for the gram <sighs> Is that why I uh, see, see, I'm very behind on that. But anyway, let me get to what we're talking about real quick. We'll get back to Instagram and social media. However, we are going to talk today about just kind of a general overview of the market. Um, I think if you'd asked me six months ago that we would have had all time low interest rates, not all time low, but the lowest interest rates we've had in six years. If you'd asked me that six months ago, I would have said you're crazy um, going into this summer. But you know, just as, Interest rates have gone down even more, even though over the last six to eight months, we've all been saying, including the lenders that we all know, have been saying, hey, interest rates are going to go up, interest rates are going to go up, money can't be free for this long. Well, now all of a sudden we sit here in quarter number, kicking off quarter number three in June in 2019, and guess what? Interest rates are still extremely low. Uh, 30-year fixed rate, no points adjusted, still looking at 425 um, you know, if you want to go 15 year, still looking at 3.3.5. I mean, it's, it's kind of crazy, um, that, you know, we've been predicting this stuff for years and, and what we're here, what we're here to talk about today is, is kind of where that's going with the market. Like what, okay. So money is still free. Prices are still rising. Where does that put us now? Where's that going to put us in the future? You know, kind of what our outlook is and, and what's changing. Um, because ultimately the market's ever changing, but, uh, you know, Ryan's got some points and we're going to kind of break it down for you. But uh, back to the Instagram thing, by the way, there's a certain person. Uh, my phone is blowing up. Speaking of which, I got a new phone, by the way. Um, I got a Google Pixel 3. So I'm upgrading my, uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an Android guy. I hate iPhones. So um, I'm, I'm much more of a Google guy than anything. So and you're going to start, start using yeah. social media a bit more? Well, I have been lately and I've picked up a lot of followers and, and honestly, I don't even post that much about real estate. I'll share some articles that I write and things like that. But, but the appearance of marketing in the world of real estate and what we do for a living and sharing your story is becoming so popular, which is interesting because I know realtors who don't do hardly any social media and they're doing as a single agent, 50, 50, 50 deals a year. And I know ones that I feel like all they do is sit on social media all day and they close 50 deals a year. And Brian's taking one right now. Um, and the other side of that is I know people who sit on social media all day as well and don't close hardly any deals. So it's interesting. So no matter what you're doing with social media as an agent, um, it, you know, somebody can look really, really busy on social media and not really do any business, um, which is kind of, we kinda see funny. that more often than not. 
I think we've, we've and more often than not, like I said, and more often than not, it is, um, more often than not, it is the case that someone who's doing a ton of social media stuff and pushing out a ton of social media stuff, they're probably not doing a lot of business um, typically because they got enough time to sit on social media. So you're obviously not out sh showing property, running numbers on things, writing up offers, um, you know, responding to offers, doing whatever you're doing. Um, so you're typically not, I mean, I struggle to make maybe two or three posts a week. And oftentimes it's a picture of my tacos that I cook or, a picture of something weird that I saw in a house that just happens to be social media worthy. If you're doing it every day, there's a chance you're probably not, you're probably not doing that much business. More Which, by the way, how, what are you charging for those tacos? Because I saw a hashtag Maddie sells tacos. Maddie sells tacos. <laughs> I, so my ultimate goal, just kind of random BS by the way, is that one day I want to have, um, if when I make enough money in real estate on the weekends, or whatever, or any events, I want to be able to have a fully scalable or a fully functional, um, not even taco truck, more like taco trailer. So I can just pull it behind my truck. Um, and if I want to go just for you, or is it like a business? This will be a business. I mean, okay. I will probably end up cooking most of it because I really enjoy doing that. But like, I'd love to take it to social events and a have my MaddieSells.com logo on it and my brokerage logo on it as well as it's just Maddie sells tacos. I mean, I'm just going to go with that. And I just kind of thought of it last night as I was messing with it. I was like, dude, that's a great way. And sometimes I can just give them away. I, I can donate the tacos too. Like if it's a smaller event and there's 30 people and I just go and donate it like to a, let's perfect example, um, chamber of commerce events, stuff like that, golf outings, things like that, where you go, Hey, there's 45 people playing this golf outing. Hey, we're going to have a food truck out in the parking lot afterwards because the golf course isn't providing food or whatever the situation may be. Or, hey, it's another option at such and such event. It's basically an event truck as a way to drive business with tacos because everyone loves tacos. Um, and you also have a connection to – here's the deal. You think about this. When somebody buys something via Square, what do you get? You get, an email. you get an email. An email and a phone number. Message. You get an email and a phone number and you get a name. Three things you need in real estate. Hey, you bought some tacos from Maddie's food truck. By the way, I'm also, I'm also a real estate agent and real estate broker and you want to buy a house anytime soon. Um, I don't know about the legality of that, which we're going to have to look into. But anyway, we got way off topic here. This, we got, is, this is just a random <laughs> business idea. But if you flip a taco upside down, it looks like- kind of looks like a house. Your tacos upside down. Ooh. Not great from a functionality standpoint. But yeah, I don't know how that standpoint. would. That may work. Maybe serve them upside down and they got to like. They've got to figure it back out after that. I don't know if we can go that way. Anyway. Um, all right. So we just, we talked about mortgage rates. Um, we got to get back on track here. We talked about mortgage rates real quick. Um, right now to that. With what? Half a point worth of fees. It's at 3.99. Yep. So. Um, that's again. Hasn't I just bought. That. I just bought a house a year ago. So prime rate for then. Prime rate then was four point four point eight seven five four point seven five right then. So we're down three quarters of a point. If it goes down a little bit more, technically speaking, I should refinance to get that one percentage point down on a thirty year loan. Um, I would probably wouldn't do that. I'd probably go to fifteen years. But anyway, if I was going to do it, but if I was going to, the logic is, hey, don't refinance unless you can get a one percent one percentage point. Lower than what you currently. What, what was your? What did you lock in for rate for last year? I was four point eight seven five on my personal home because I bought last year as well, and I locked in four point three seven five. Yeah, see, I was later though. So yeah, uh, I was in. Well, I was in. I didn't pay any points either, too. So we just went with the higher. There but, you go. Yeah, we were four point eight seven five. I mean, I have you know almost eight hundred credit. So yeah that was what was that was because we were originally at 4.58 or 575 i think and then it went up and it would just it, but it just it just kept fluctuating the whole time so you're going to be anywhere between 4.25 and 4.875 i mean somewhere in between there i think 4.875 was probably the highest it got and i thought and i kept thinking i'm like man we got to do this now if they're going to go up and up go up and up and up and i'm like ah, oh, 4.875 i feel pretty good about that now all of a sudden a year later i'm like Shit, I could, I could be at three point nine nine right now. Yeah, come on. So they were they they snuck up all last year though. I mean, it was yeah. I mean, it was weird trending up. So, yep. but to your point earlier of the market's ever changing, rates are ever changing, the market's yep. ever changing. 
if you if you held out and rates right now were at five and a half percent, you would have been saying you you did the right thing, you know? You did the right thing, exactly. So. Um, and I don't think I did the wrong thing, and I don't think anybody that did, is in the situation that bought in 2018, 2019, early 2019 is wrong. Um, yeah. You know, they, I mean, there's still a good rate. I mean, think back to when our parents were buying houses, they were buying, they were paying 12% on a mortgage. So um, now houses were also worth a lot less then. Correct. So here's the deal. Yeah, imagine paying 12% on a $300,000 house. Yeah, no. So here's the deal. With that comes, so how the, how's the market changing? So uh, prices are still rising, okay? Um, prices are still rising and we're seeing a couple things. So number one, and you probably have some more statistics on this, but prices are rising. So in order to, for consumers to still have the buying power, basically the interest rates have to stay low. The banks are still making their money because if the, the higher the price, obviously, a, seven per, you know, a 12% loan on a $90,000 house in 1984, but a $90,000 house was a lot of, that was a, that was a nice house. Okay, $90,000 house right now, at least in our market, not that nice. Okay. Um, now eight, you know, 4% on a $480,000 house, it's probably going to make the bank almost the same thing as a 10%, 10% loan on a, let's say a $90,000 home. Yeah. I don't know if that's close to accurate, but those numbers would seem to make sense and just kind of how that flips and works in that area. So banks are still fine with making their money. There's there, banks are never going to be poor. Let's, let's clarify that. Yeah. They're not um, doing this. This isn't a charity, you know, charity no, no. Um, so what is, what is the higher prices mean for the buyer from the buyer aspect for somebody who wants to go buy now? Um, I've had two things happen lately. I can tell you that one buyer of mine has said, man, these prices are high. I'm going to wait. I'm going to save my money and I'm going to make sure I have more money down. So my buying power can go up. So I've seen that happen. Okay. Um, number two, you sacrifice, you sacrifice what you really, really want, which some people, if it's important to get into a home for them, they'll sacrifice it. No big deal. Um, and the biggest thing is they'll expand their search. They'll start looking at different neighborhoods. Like if somebody wants to be in Jacksonville beach um, or somebody wants to be in Hermosa beach where it's expensive in California to give an example, they're going to go maybe more inland or something like that. They may open, open their search a little bit more and, you know, kind of broaden their spectrum. Um, so that's what, things are doing there. Um, the other thing is that we haven't got to talking about this yet, but the millennials um, are probably the biggest buyer pool right now. And that's people in their mid thirties to early twenties. I think actually all the way even up to their almost late thirties. Um, so I believe it all, if you're 40 right now, I think you're still kind of included or you're close to it. Uh, I think it's 37, 38, 37, yeah, 37, 37, 38 right now, all the way to like 25. 25. Yeah. So this generation is, uh, and I want to talk about this just shortly and then I'm going to let, I'm going to hand it back over to you for some more in, intellectual statistics. Cause I'm too stupid to really go into that. But the millennials are interesting because as millennials, we've grown up with really, really high quality stuff. Um, we've seen a sh- from quality over quantity. Um, we've never grown up with bad quality of stuff in anything in our lives, whether it was phones or TVs, or it was always about the highest quality and what the new thing was because we were so driven in a society that was very, very much keeping up with the Joneses, which we've already talked about a couple of times and very, and very much based around materialistic things. So with that becomes, I need everything in my house to be very high quality. Okay. I'm going to use this as an example. Um, we have a county just south of us that has a lot, a lot of very, very large homes. Are they high quality? The short answer to that is most of them are not. Okay. They were massive homes. It was cheap land. It got developed. It's still a very nice place to live. I'm not saying that at all. I, you know, I know nothing against St. John's County, but it's just this weird conundrum that comes with it is <clears throat> I had a person contact me the other day that had a 3,900 square foot home. And I'll give two examples here. And he wants to rent it. Here's the thing about renting a 3,900 square foot home. You ain't gonna, you're not going to make your money back on it from a rental standpoint. It's not going to happen. Okay. Just cause there's not renters aren't looking for a 4,000 square foot house, especially millennials. It's quality over quantity. You have a lot of a house. Is it that high quality? 
No, because it's probably builder grade appliances, builder grade bathrooms. Everything is just normal, cheap crap. Okay. Um, not to mention it's probably stucco and it's built out of cheap plywood and they slapped it up there in probably about 90 days. Um, that's probably what happened. That being said, what does that guy do with that property? There's not a lot of millennials that are buying 4,000 square foot houses either because we've kind of had this shift in society that I don't need all this crap. It just causes clutter. I got to find places to store it. Like that's kind of our generation. We're in the, we're in the tiny home era right now. Yeah. We have people that are our age that want to build tiny homes on yeah. in state parks and live. Yeah. And it, it, it's just, they don't even care about owning their own house. Like, so to, for a millennial to go buy a 4,000 square foot house and be like, Oh, this is great. That thing's sitting, man. And that was the first thing that I said, probably 10, 12, almost a year ago, I said, it's going to hit that weird in between market that are these big houses that millennials just don't want. Like if you need more than 2000 square foot to really live, like 2000 square foot's a big house. Like if you need more than that, probably something wrong as yeah. an average human. <clears throat> if you have seven kids or you have nine kids and you're like a huge Catholic family or something like that, I get that. <laughs> you got to have space for them all. But uh, the average family has one and a half kids in America yeah, I need about half a kid. So, nah, explain that one to me. All right. You know what I mean, Dick. Statistics. <laughs> okay. I think it's actually like 1.7 or something like that. So That makes more sense. Yeah, because that makes more sense. Yeah. He was, just, he, he was born without a leg. So and I, if I'm picking on handicapped people at this point, I really apologize. Um, but I, what I mean is somewhere in between one and two kids or maybe a little bit on the higher end to three is the average family size in America. That number is actually growing. Um, but anyway – Getting back to that, you don't need that much space. So we have all these massive houses in this area that we're dealing with that I think people are going to understand. Like people in New York City, guys, they're living in 400 square foot apartments and there's three people in those. Like that's a thing. Like you don't need all that space. So we have this massive. People in New York City would love to have 4,000 square feet at the price they're paying for the 400 square feet. They're paying four hundred thousand dollars. Probably, probably more expensive for what they're living in than to have. Yeah, a absolutely. So, so we're in this weird market that's changing. Um, and the other side of that is, you know, location. Millennials don't like uh, millennials. Yes, they do like to be out in the suburbs, but they're more likely to want to be into the city where there's things to do, and I can get out and go do this. And even with their kids, there's a lot of people that don't. The whole urban sprawl thing. I want to be in the suburbs. I want to be in the suburbs. I want to be in the suburbs. That will change over time. And that's, it's just where we're at um, with our society. And that's who the buyer pool is. So that's, that's changing for a lot of people. Um, so I, the statistics here is millennials will lead the way, lead the way in the number of mortgages accounting for 45% of the market in 2019, followed by Gen Xers at 37 and baby boomers at 17%. So your baby booming population over the last 20 years has largely been suburb, 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 suburb. Get me out of the city. Get me out of the city. That's going to change. Um, so it's a, it's an interesting world that we live in at the moment. Um, yeah. yeah the, this, the shift is certainly interesting. As far as statistics as in April, year over year, home sales in general for the month of April from – March fell 0.4% year over year. They were down 4.4%. Yeah. So in comparison to what was again, selling in 2018 versus what was selling in April of 2019 median sale price went up overall as a nation to 67.3. So $267,300. Um, median is the median sale price for the entire country. Correct. Yep. And it's that was probably, up. I feel like Jacksonville is a very average city. So that's probably yeah. darn close to what ours actually is. And that was up 3.6% year over year. Okay. So again, the last, well, probably four years here, we've been seeing, at least in Jacksonville, almost double digit growth year over year oh, as far as, crazy. you know, sales prices go. Well, so in, in Florida as a whole got smacked with the, uh, with the housing bubble in general. So, I mean, that's what, that was almost, yeah, there's been a lot of growth, but there was also a lot of recovery to be made, you know? Right. Yeah. So, 
So, and then the other one is a month supply. So essentially we're looking at an absorption rate. And by that we mean how many houses are on the market and how long is it going to take to sell those homes? So for example, if we have six properties and we're on average, we're selling one property a month, mm -hmm. you've got six months worth of supply. Basically say anything under three months is a seller's market where again, just hard to keep inventory up there. Anything three to six is, you know, basically you know, pretty stable. Yep. And obviously the closer you get to six, the more it shifts. Now correction. I just, I just did some numbers on this the other day and most areas of Jacksonville were towards the upper sixes at this point right now. A lot of that, is that false or is that? Yeah. So this on a nation average, oh, this right, was a year, okay. year over year, okay. we're up. So it was about a four month supply last year. This year, right now, we're at a 4.2% supply. So, so if, yeah. you figure you got an extra week on the market, you know? Yeah. So it's slowing down a little bit, but it's not much. It's slowing down slightly. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, but right now to the point of, hey, lower interest rates, that's keeping everything flowing, even with some home prices sneaking up a little bit. We can see just trending as home sales overall are down, home supply again is up, you know, but keeping interest rates down is still keeping the market moving forward. Well, and that was what, like we were talking about, you know, six, eight months ago, we're saying, hey, if interest rates are at six, six and a half percent, you're limiting the buying power of the consumer. And that's honestly where a lot of us thought it was going to go. But now we're sitting here, obviously we were wrong. And this is, and this again is why, if it makes sense, like, you know, buying a house for your own personal sake, um, it's a controlled savings account, do it. Okay. It's not bad. So if you're listening to somebody, you know, everybody and nobody in the, in their right mind was saying, Hey, interest rates are going to go down. Don't worry about it. Blah, 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 blah. No one was saying that a year ago. We all assumed they were going to be up. So now we're sitting here and this is, again, this is the market. This is what happens. So none of us know, none of us know how, how everything's going to react with another thing. So again, don't listen to us. If it works for you to go buy a home, okay, then do it and be happy with what it is as long as you can afford it within your budget. And that's the biggest thing I think you can take out of this is, you know, the market's always going to change and in buying a house, it's like a stock market too. You ain't lost shit until you sold it. Okay. So you can ride the waves as long as you want to, if it makes sense for you to get out of the game um, as an investor standpoint, then go ahead and do it too, because right now you can. Um, and, you know, with interest rates staying low, it, it'll keep our prices pretty, should keep our prices pretty high. Um, not it depends really on, it depends on what you're, what you're financing too, because to but, that, a half a percent in an interest rate it's not like it's $500 a month. Now it could be if you're, maybe if you're financing a million dollars, but sure. you know, on a $200,000 home, half a percent interest rate, that could be $80. You know, it's not a huge fluctuation. Yes, there's a fluctuation in your payment, but where you, we're not you want to check, where you want to check is that $80 a month over 360 payments. Well, that's where you get your, you know, added that's savings your, on a, there's your 28, there's your, there's your $29,000. Okay. Yeah. Now exactly. that being said, if we and let's talk about a situation we were talking about it the other day, Hey, if you're going to refinance your house, um, but you're planning on moving in three years or whatever the case may be, should you do it? Like we just said, if I wanted to refinance for a full point lower on my interest rate, no, excuse me, I don't want to use a point, a full percentage points are different than percentages, a full percentage and go from like my personal situation is 4.875. Would it be smart to go down to a 3.99, pay a half percentage point um, and get that and buy that rate down to get close to that 1%? I think it would if I was going to stay in this property for probably five to seven years. Breaking well, that's where it becomes, and again, we're not lenders by any means, but just for estimation purposes, look, if, if you were financing $200,000 and you could save yourself $1,500 a year by going down, but it was going to cost you $6,000 to refinance to that. Well, you'd have to stay in that house for another four years until you broke even. Now you're going to be in there for five or six years. It may be worth doing. Might be worth Maybe it. Not yeah. Spending the 6,000 now to do, to try to get $1,500 at the end of it. But to that point, there is a break even point where it makes right. sense to do that jump. And once you hit that four year mark from there on forward, you're, putting extra money in your pocket, essentially. Correct. Yep. So, and it all depends on your situation. So, and the other side of that is closing costs 
I'm sure there's a lender out there. If you really go search hard enough, um, that will probably take your loan for very little closing cost. Um, they will refinance you for very little closing cost if you want to search hard enough. And I know there are ones out there. I'm not going to name them because I don't want you to be pissed when you have really, really shitty service. But um, <laughs> there, there are uh, some, some ones out there that will do that. So um, they advertise all the time. No closing cost. Um, if you live in this area, you know exactly who I'm talking about. But um, I got an email the other day. And this was on a, <laughs> we're getting, we get email, crazy emails. I opened, I opened up, I opened up a can of worms, didn't I? Oh yeah. Let's see. I got okay, to while we're, while we're chatting here, but it was from a, some sort of lender. Let me see. Uh, rental refi cash out, no docs, low credit score. Okay. No tenants. It's okay too. <laughs> so how, how, how does that work? We'll refinance your rental property that's not producing any income. You don't need to show, you know, any sort of financial docs proving your standing and you can have a low credit score. That sounds like the ideal candidate that a lender would want to lend to. So I have two thoughts running through my mind right now. Number one, ladies and gentlemen, this is why you don't smoke crack and lend money. Okay. That's, that's number one. Number two, um, Nah, I'm just going to leave it at number one. There's no number two. But this is why you don't smoke crack and lend money. Um, now, again, hey, more power to them. Maybe, uh, maybe that's going to work out for you. But let me know how that works in 10 years or 15. Or They're four. on my list of people Actually. to call the chat and see what's up because that sounds like a – And my thought number like two a, was if it's too good to be true, it probably is. They, they probably have an introductory APR of 0% for – the first 30 years. It's like a fucking balloon loan. <laughs> yeah. I was say, it's, a, it's basically a three-year arm. And by the way, after that, your percentage goes to 14 or something crazy. Yeah, probably. I don't know. Yeah, it's something which, which I think are out there's no, there's no There's no numbers on it at all. That's, it's just a – I'm going to all email it too. It's just a yellow ad and it just well, – Technically speaking, you're not no allowed – No docs. As, as, a, as a lender, I believe, no you're, not allowed to, you're not allowed to market any numbers on a, as a lender, technically. I think people do low APR percentage. You can, it depends on how you disclose it. Number, yeah, it's, it's, I'd, I'd have to ask a lender, but I know there's rules and regulations against disclosing percentage rates on mortgages and things like that as far as a lender is concerned um, because everybody qualifies for something different. So when you advertise, hey, call me, I'll get you a 3.5% rate. Well, yeah, if you got 840 credit, like that's the only way you can get it. So it's basically false advertising. So damn, well, now that I'm looking in the fine print, they do commercial loans up to 500 million, Matt. So somebody's got some money. Let's go, let's go buy some stuff, man. Let's go buy some shit. eh? Yeah. All right. Well, man, you got anything else? No, I've got nothing. This, uh, that's it. We got this out a day late. So I do apologize to our loyal listeners about that. Um, we are trying something new video wise. I think it looks, I think it looks good. I don't know. You guys tell us, um, See how it looks I like haven't it. gotten any emails together. from the, uh, I have not got any emails about the free Amazon gift card, um, that we talked about on, on Memorial day. I Nothing. forgot about that. Let's do another giveaway for, well, we had it on the podcast, but it went out late, didn't it? Or no, I will, I will, here's the deal. Here's the deal. We will run the same promotion. If you send us <laughs> until we get an email. Until we get email us, that's the new promotion. <laughs> I want to get five people. So your chances, we need five people in the drawing. Five yep. people. That's it. Five. So one out of five, you have a twenty percent chance of winning a twenty-five dollar Amazon gift card. Once we hit five, the contest, five people. Uh, contest ends. Five people. Maddie at maddiesells dot com. Send me an email. What did we even ask for the last time? Send me an email on what you want to hear us talk about. I don't care. Five people. All we said was put in the subject title Titus. Yeah, we did. So email at Titus. Give us a suggestion for an episode that you want to listen on. That's what I really want. Yeah. I want to hear what the people, I want to do what the people want to hear. Uh, we'll break it down. We'll do a little more prep. Like, honestly, we're at episode number 17. Uh, we tried a couple trending, trending markets, trending, trending market things. Um, you know, just from a property management standpoint, from an investing standpoint. But honestly, if we're not breaking down what you want to hear, then there's no reason for us to even really do the episode other than listening to ourselves talk and enjoying each other's company, which we do anyway. So we never do this to make money. We don't promote anything, which I think is, I think is why people want to listen to us. Uh, we're not trying to sell you anything. 
Um, there's no advertisements in the middle of it. And I really want to keep, keep it that way. I don't ever want to do that. Um, it's a podcast. Do, do we do it because we enjoy it and we enjoy talking about real estate. And if uh, anybody can learn anything from us, uh, more power to them. So other than that, man, um, what you got going on the rest of the week? It's Wednesday. Um, we're getting this out, like I said, a day late. But uh, anything going on? I know you had two big closings or three closings on last Friday. So you had a really busy day. I had three closings last Friday, six overall for the month of May. So it was a okay. good month. A good month. Uh, picked up a, an extra that rental mean, that for the going, portfolio. So going on vacation like next week? No, we talked actually our, our podcast last week was talking about the total money. Makeover. You, you got me on that book. So I'm just, kidding. Spending stops here. Man. Yeah, I actually, Hungry well, I said now. I got a new phone. And the reason why I got the Pixel was, I, did I really need the brand new fancy Galaxy S10? The answer to that was no. Okay, I, do I want it? Absolutely I do. But I got a brand new phone that probably has 90% of the capability that the Galaxy does. And actually so far, after about a day and a half, which is not long, um, not even a full day actually. So I'm, I'm liking it a lot. So, and, it, and it's cheaper and it was saving me $40 a month off my monthly bill with all the same features and capabilities of whatever. And I mean, when, when these things yeah. came out and, and they just, too. and they just flipped, you know, they just, all we had to use them for was calling. Yeah. Now we use them for everything else. And now we've got a computer in our hand. We got one in front of our face. Absolutely. 24 seven. So, so, Anyway, yeah. So again, I, I saved I saved myself money yesterday. So again, to each his own. It's it's not about it's not about how much you're making. It's about how much you're keeping. So that's uh, always always remember that for just financial advice in general. So like it. All right, man. I don't have anything else. I'm gonna start the outro here, and we're gonna take us on the way out. Cool. You're gonna give me a thumbs up here when I take this new photo. When you take this new photo. Nude. Thanks for listening to our podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, there's a few things I'd like you to do. Subscribe, leave a review, and head over to nobsrealestatepodcast.com where you can connect with Matt and I on all of the platforms we're on. Also, if you could do us a favor, leave a message letting us know what you enjoyed about the episode and what you'd like to hear about going forward. Publish this bitch.